ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I hope that all of the sisters are doing good welcome back once again after the weekend and I hope that that was a good one for you and that you you know rest took rest and now that you are again fresh for this weekend's classes inshallah right because these are going to be the last classes last three to four sessions i guess today is going to be lesson number like 20 of surah mulk and um, yes in the previous lessons we revised the rules of noon sakin and tanween and then we revised the rules of meme sakin of the read and um today we will also revise you know certain things and yes um which will be like the uh waqf right how how do we take a pause or a break when we are reciting because you know all of us has different have different levels on of how long we can hold our breath right when we are reciting some people can recite the you know short ayahs complete right in just one go but for some they you know uh, they struggle because uh, if they are beginners they will have to think of the letters and their articulation and that is how they will maybe you know able to just articulate one letter or two letters uh, at a time so for that you know when we are or even just um, reciting uh, casually as well when we want to take a break in the ayah at any word we want to stop in the ayah to take a break there are like proper ways to do that right we just don't do according to our own choice so that just depends on the word on which we stop and also specifically on the last letter of that word at, at which we stop. So I, you know, summarized that. I summarized uh, these in like six points, which you can see in front of you, right? The six points that you see in front of you. There are like other uh, details to these as well. But I, you know, for the beginners, I have just, you know, mentioned the six points right now. We will inshallah discuss one by one. But if you, you know, stop at any word, at any word which ends with a letter and that has a sakin on it. For example, you know, you see this Surah Alam Nashroh here. The first ayah, it says Alam Nashroh. The Nashroh, the, at the end of this word, there is a ha with a sakin on it, right? Sakin. So if somebody is beginner and they just cannot recite this whole ayah, and they just want to, you know, take a break here and say, Alam nash roh. So how they will take a break is that the last letter of this nash roh has a sakin on it. So the rule says that we will keep it, this as it is. You know, it will remain sakin. We will just say, Alam nash roh. And we can, you know, breathe. And then we can say, Laka sadrak. Right, like this. So the first point is that if you are taking a break at any letter which already has a sakin on it, so that will just remain as it is, okay? Okay, the second point says that if you take a break at any letter with a fatha dhamma kasra dhammatain kasratain at the end. Let, let's see them one by one, okay? So this rule has like five points to it. Fatha dhamma kasra dhammatain kasratain. And we have, you know, skipped this fathatain. Fathatain comes in the next rule, okay? This rule is concerned with fatha dhamma kasra dhammatain and, you know, kasratain. So if we take at any word which ends with these, uh, you know, symbols, or you can say, so what we will do is that we will make them suck in, you know, all of these things, we will make them suck in. So first, let's see the example with Fatha. 
Okay, Fatha is here. If you are reciting this ayah and we say, Alladhi khalaq al maut At the end, you know, on the letter of Ta, there is a Fatha. So it says that we just change that into Sakin. And we say, Maut rather than Mauta. We say, خلق الموت We change the second. Let's see الضمة. This uh, word here has a الضمة at the end. So if we say تبارك الذي بيده الملك So we will change this الضمة into into ساكن, right? Into ساكن. And we say الملك rather than ملكو and then, you know, let's see with kasra as well. For example, if you say tabarak alladhi biyadihi. At the end here, on ha, there is a kasra. So we change that to sakin and we say biyadihi. We change ha kasra with, you know, ha sakina. Okay, so the next is dhammatayn. So here at this word, there is a dhammatayn on qadirun. So we will say, وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ I change the raw dhammatain with raw sakin on it, okay? And uh, the next is with kasratain. For this, we will have to, you know, see the next example. Here, وَقُلْنَا مَا نَزَّلَ اللَّهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Okay, so here shayin, and if you take a break here, it, at the end on Hamza, there is kasratain, right? The two uh, kasras below the letter, they're kasras, so we change that into sakin. And we say shay. So whenever, you know, Hamza has a sakin on it, we make this jerk sound, and we say shay. Right? You can hear the Hamza. If you will not, not make the jerk sound, it, you, it, it, it will seem like you haven't even articulated this Hamza at the end. That will be like Shay. So we will have to, for, in order to, you know, articulate this Hamza with a Sakin on it, we just make a jerk. Mew Shay. Okay, so these are, this was the second point, okay? So uh, for this point, you will have to remember this fa uh, further five points, okay? Fatha, Dhamma, Kasra, Dhamma, Tain. And Kasra, Tain, let's see the one we skipped, which was Fatha, Tain. This point says that if you take a break at any word with Fatha, Tain, we change that to Aleph. One Aleph. So specifically, we can say that we keep one Fatha of this Fatha, Tain, and we change the second uh, you know, uh, Fatha to Aleph. For example, لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا So this was عَمَلًا عَمَلًا, right? So also I, you know, mentioned previously as well in the, in the previous lessons when we did these rules that you will have to, you know, look at the voice actually. This word here, عَمَلًا at the end, you can see an alif at the end as well, right? But, you know, we are not articulating that alif. When there is a, you know, tanween of fathatain, we articulate that tanween. We are not articulating the sound of this alif at the end. We articulate this word of amalan like this. I can write this as well, right? The sound of it. Like amalan. The end alif, we do not articulate that. So... What happens is the, in this rule is that you are not supposed to confuse that, okay, so this word is ending with alif, uh, you know, so we just say it, um, uh, we can just apply another rule. No, for this rule, there is a tan uh, tanween at the end of fathatain, of two fathas at the end, right? So we see the sound of amalan, we just do not look at this alif. So uh, for this fathatain, we change that to, I said alif. So as I said that, we can write the sound of it like amalan, like this as well. So what we do is that on lamb letter, there are there is a fathatain, right? Tanween on top of it. So we change that tanween with lamb, fatha, and then alif. And we say la. Rather than lan, we say la. Amalan to la. So that is why I have written here as well, that we keep one fatha and we change the next we say ayyukum ahsanu amala right in the second example here alladhi khalaqa sab'a samawati tibaqa 
so again you know at the end you see an alif as well but you know we just do not articulate that so that is why we can write the sound like this as well okay so i have written you know there was a kasra here below ti tibaqan like that okay tibaqan and we just change this qan to qa fatha alif qa tibaqa okay so this was the third point Fourth one says that if we take a break at any letter with a round ta at the end, right, right, round ta, okay? So we change that to ha sakin. So let's see the example. لِنَجْعَلَهَا لَكُمْ Okay, so this تَذْكِرَةً On ta here, this is a round ta, right? Not this flat ta that you say. This is a round ta and this has, you know, a fathatain on it. The tanween of fatha. Thing, right so fathatain so you will not say that okay there is a fathatain so we change that into alif sound okay you for this rule uh, whenever there comes a ta round ta and you know it does not matter if that has a fathatain or a dhammatain on top of that you just see a round ta you automatically you know just quickly change that ta to ha sakin if you if you are taking a break at any such word okay so we say tazkirah Rather than tazkiratan, we say tazkirah. Also, you know, when this word comes, um, we are supposed to articulate this this ha sakin at the end properly. Otherwise, you know, you will just skip the sound of it. So when we say tazkirah, ra with ha sakina, ra, right? So you you have to make it prominent. Okay, the fifth point says that if you take a break at any letter with a dagger alif, or this you can say standing straight line symbol above any letter, then you change that. Okay, so let's see the example. So, wadluha. At the end, again, you're not supposed to confuse this and say, okay, this at the end, there's a ya here. No, there isn't a ya when it comes to the sound of it. The way you articulate it, you say, wadluha. You are not, you know, articulating this ya uh, at the end, okay? So that is why you you will have to look at the sound at the end. There is a standing straight line with regards to the sound of it. So we change this. Uh, we just do not do anything. We just keep them as it is, okay? Uh, same as the example with ta. We keep this uh, straight standing line above the letter as it is. Wadduha and ta. Okay, so the next two are the standing straight line below the letter, okay? And this uh, inverted comma symbol. So you are like familiar with this standing straight line, right? And uh, you for this inverted comma, you will have to just uh, look closely, okay? Because you, you are not supposed to confuse this inverted comma with the simple comma. The simple dhamma, we articulate that for like one count. For example, on the ha letter, if we have a dhamma, we just say who, who, right? For just for one count, who. But when there is an inverted dhamma, we say who. We just elongate it for two counts and say who, ya ra who. So if we take a break at any such word, we change that into ha sakin as well. When we say ya ra. Ya roh. At the end, we change this inverted dhamma to ha sakina. And, you know, same is the case with the standing straight line below any letter. For example, be he. So we say be. Be. Okay. So that was just an overview of the rules that we did related to waqf uh, and uh, summarized in six points. I hope that, inshallah, you will get to remember these with practice. Let's move on to our ayahs for today's which are ayah number 25th and 26th. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Wayakuluna mata hadal wa'adu inkum. صادقين. قل إنما العلم عند الله وإنما أنا نذير 
Mobile. Okay, so very short ayahs for today. And uh, yes, I hope that you remember the rules of Noon, Sakin, and Tanween, somewhat of them, right? So this ayah starts with letter Wow. And whenever we articulate letter Wow, what do we do? We shape our lips round and when we say Wa. We can simply say Wa by not shaping our lips round as well. But you know, this is the quality of this letter like the sift of this letter, that we shape our lips round, and that is how the, the proper sound of this letter comes. And we say, wa. Wa yaquluna. The next letter is ya letter. A middle portion of the tongue is raised towards the palate, and we say, ya. Wa ya. Wa yaquluna. Qu. Qaf letter. Qaf. This qafia, right, with the dhamma on it, this is a heavy letter. And, you know, you articulate it when you put the back of your tongue to, to the soft palate with strength. And you say, qu, qu, wa yaquluna, qu. I'm stretching this qu for two counts because there is, you know, a vaumadda here. Vaumadda means that if vaw has a sakin on it and on the previous letter, there is a dhamma. So we will make a sound of like double, double O when we say O, O, right? وَيَقُولُونَ Laum letter with a dhamma on it. Again, you articulate it when you put the tip of your tongue at the back of your upper teeth. Lu, وَيَقُولُونَ Specifically, laum comes when you put the tip of your tongue at the hard palate. Lu. Again, I'm stretching for two counts because of vaumadda again here. وَيَقُولُونَ وَيَقُولُونَ مَتَى Meme letter, simply articulated when we join our two lips together and we say مَا مَتَى تَا تَا letter, the light letter, tip of the tongue, when you touch that with the back of your upper teeth and you say تَا مَتَى مَتَى Again, I'm stretching ta here for two counts. When you say one, two, you can count that on your fingers. Ta. You know, the, the, the basic symbols of fatha, dama, and kasra, you articulate them for one second. You can say like ma, just na, right? And you just double their sounds and you say two counts. Ma ta, ma ta, right? Hadal, hadal. Again, there is this standing straight line here on ha. So we just stretch this for two counts as well. And this ha is from the portion of the throat that is near to our chest. Ha, ha, right? Mata ha dal. Okay, so the next letter is a dal letter, the soft dal, tip of the tongue. It touches the tip of your upper teeth. The. وَيَقُولُونَ مَتَى هَذَا الذل, Right? So I'm, you know, joining this ذا with the next lam because lam has a sakin on it. So we say ذل هَذَا الوَعْدُ وَعْدُ Again, wow here. Lips should be round. وَعْدُ So the next letter is عَيْن عَيْن letter which is a letter of throat, comes from the middle portion of your throat, okay? Ah, this, this, the sound has a ah, but here, because, you know, it has a sakin on it, so we cannot just articulate it as it is. We'll have to join this with the previous letter and say, wah, wah. And also, you know, uh, I just repeat this so many times that whenever this ain, ain, these letters, they come with a sakin on them, we avoid making kalkala. Qalqala is that, you know, there are five letters which when they come in the, with a the sakin on them, their sound bounces back. There is an echo in them. So this ayin letter is not from the, those five letters. Of, qaf, ta, ba, jim, dal. So this ayin is not a kalkala letter. The quality of this ayin letter is that this has a rikhwa in it, which means like softness or the, the sound, it is not, you know, you just, just do not stop at this word when it, it has a sakin on it quickly. You, you do not say like, wah. You do not make a jerk. You do not, uh, you know, make this echo in this. So we just say, wah. The sound of this ayin letter with the sakin 
it just goes on you can say it just continues at the articulation point and we say wah you know for avoiding kalkala the tip just can be that you stay for a second or two at the articulation point of ain which is the middle portion of our throat and we say wa'adu hadha alwa'adu wa'adu right i hope you can hear this hadha alwa'adu i letter okay so dal letter again you know a light letter tip of the tongue it touches the back of your upper teeth and you say du wa'adu inkuntum inkuntum okay so in in this word of in there is a noon suck in here and after noon suck in there is calf letter the light calf so this is from the 15 letters which when come after noon suck in or tanween we do the ikhfa rule ikhfa mean hiding hiding what hiding hiding the sound of this letter noon in noon suck in so rather than saying in we say we also make a nasal sound when we are hiding automatically a nasal sound is produced and that is called like ikhfa rules that we are hiding the sound of noon sack in here and we say again here in the same rule of ikhfa is applied but you know with the letter ta after noon sack in okay so we say Okay, so the calf letter here, this is, a, this is a light calf and this is articulated when the back part of the tongue, it touches both the hard and as well as soft palate and we say koo, koo, the koo sound. Okay, the, so the letter ta, tip of the tongue, touches the back of our upper teeth and we say tu, <clears throat> tu, right? Tum, again joining the sound with the next letter of meme because meme has a sakin on it. Sadiqeen. Sadiqeen. So this is a sad letter, right? So I just forgot to mention that here as well, that you have to focus this word here in today's lesson as well, because this is a heavy letter. And uh, uh, for this letter, you have to raise the back part of your tongue as much as you can. And you say saw, saw, right? You just, uh, you just, uh, you can say capture the air in your mouth. And you raise the back part of your tongue as well. Some of the air, you remove it from your mouth. And some of it stays, you know, be beneath your cheeks. And you say, so, so. This is not the sa sound. Sa. This is so, the heavy sound of so. So, again, we are stretching here for two counts. Because this has a standing straight line on it. So, we say, so, the clean. Da letter again, just like here, do. This is D and qin. Qaf letter, the heavy one, qi, qi, right? And stretching again for two counts because of ya madda here. Qin. At the end, noon letter has a fatha. So we did the rules of waqf today as well. If we are, you know, if we will stop here in the ayah, obviously we'll take a break here in the ayah. So we change this fatha with a sakin and we say qin. Rather than qina. Qul innama al-ilmu. Qul. Qaf letter, the heavy one. Qul. Qul innama. Innama. This word has a noon tashdeed here. So whenever there is noon tashdeed or meem tashdeed, we do gunna there. Kunna means that we stay for a bit on the letter noon sound or if there is a meme with a tashdeed, we stay on them and we make a nasal sound. So we say in <clears throat> right? in ilmu Meme letter <clears throat> with your lips and you join the sound with the next letter of lam because lam has a sakin. So we say mal. in ilmu Ilmu, I letter <clears throat> from the middle portion of your throat. Ilmu, right? So you are supposed to differentiate the sound with Hamza, right? So we say Ilmu, I, I, okay. Ilmu, 
So um, again, joining with the lam sakin here because of sakin. Ilmu Allah. Again, a ain letter with a, a kasra below it. So again, you know, for these ain letters, obviously it just depends on you how much effort you put in the middle portion of your throat. Okay, so we can just keep on repeating that this comes from the middle portion, this comes from the middle portion, and that this is not the sound of Hamza. But you know, it just depends on how much effort again you put to constrict the muscles of your throat, and then you push the sound of ri. Here in this word, there is again a noon sakin, and after noon sakin, there is da letter. So this ikhfa rule again is repeated here in today's lesson. So because of da letter, which is from the 15 letters on we, which we do this rule of ikhfa, and ikhfa means hiding. So we will hide the sound of noon here and say, Okay, so the letter, the light, the light letter, tip of the tongue touches the back of your upper teeth. The sound, the lahi. Okay, so there is again, you know, small rule here, which is, you know, uh, related to the letter lam. That whenever you know there is Allah's name, and in that the letter lam. So, uh, whenever that lam before that lam on the previous letter, there is a fatha, fatha. So on the previous letter here is dal. Dal has a fatha on it, right? So that is why we will make the lamb of Allah's name heavy. And we say, Dallahi. I'm not saying the la, la. My mouth does not feel empty when I say la. I'm saying law, law, right? Dallahi. So I'm making this lamb heavy. Why? Because whenever the lamb of Allah's name, before that, on the previous letter, if there is fatha or dhamma, we make it heavy. If there is kasra, we make it light. So here we will make it uh, heavy because dal has a fatha. So we say dallahi. So if it, you know, take a break here, uh, we will just change this ha uh, with the kasra to ha sakin, right? And we say, the law. We are supposed to make the ha second prominent at the end. Wa inna Okay, again here in this word, there is again a noon tashtid, so we will make again gunna. Wa inna On ma here, there is a mud. Mud means stretching. So let's see the hamza after it. So if mud is in one word and hamza after it, it, it comes in the next word. So it is your choice. Either you want to stretch this mud for two counts or for four counts. I will do this for four counts, okay? Wa innama ana nadhirum mubin. Okay, so I stretch this for four counts. And after this, Hamza sound, a uh, simple sound and n sound of noon letter, the nasal sound. But here in this word, you see at the end of na, there is an alif as well. But you know, you will see that in your musaf as well, that uh, there will be a this uh, small uh, round like o, small o written here. So, or you can say the small zero written. So you just do not, you just skip the sound of it. Okay, so I will not articulate the alif sound here. I will not stretch uh, the sound here. And I will just say ana, ana. Hamza and Noon both for one second. I, I will not say na. I will say na. Ana nadhiru mubin. Nadhiru. Okay, so the letter here, tip of the tongue, touches the tip of your upper teeth. And you say this soft sound of the. Nadhi. The. Right? The. I'm stretching this for two counts because there is again Yamada here. And we say nadirun. Okay, so on raw letter here, the, there's tomatain, there's a tanween. So after the tanween, there is letter meme here. So whenever afternoon sakin or tanween comes any letter from the six letters of Yermaloon, or you can say specifically the human letters, ya wa meme noon, we do the idgham rule. Idgham means assimilating the sound or entering one sound into the other. This rule of idgham. With gunna, 
with making gunna as well, right? So we will say nadi rum. I'm also doing idgham, which is like assimilating the sound of this tanween into the next letter of meme. Rum. But I'm also staying here on meme and making a nasal sound. So we will say rum mubin. Right? I just do not quickly say rum mubin. But I just give time to hear to this letter of meme here, okay, and make a nasal sound. And I say Navi Rum Mubi Wa in Nama Ana Navi Rum Mubi Mubin. Uh, so uh, ba letter, and after that, there is again Yamada. So we will stretch the sound of B. For two counts again, and at the end, this this is a new letter with the bomma tain on it. And we did the rules of box that whenever we end at this word, we will change this tonwin of bomma tain to sakin. And we say mubin rather than mubinun. So that is it for today's lesson. Um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, ma'am. Wa alaikum I wish and pray that all the participants are, and all the sisters are in the best state of health and in not, and may let me feel like that forever. We'll start our lesson, which actually is really very brief because I have already short. We'll go forward, forward meaning of uh, this ayat and then a bit of uh, explanation and obviously the metaphoric uh, translation meaning as well. So let's begin. The ayat starts with وَيَقُونُونَ Wa is conjunctive word. It you know, joins, used for joining the clauses or phrases, you can say. وَيَقُولُونَ And they say. Uluna is from the root words of wa and la. Mata. Mata is a question word. In Arabic, we have two categories of question words. One is a uh and hal, and then a bit advanced question words um, include this one as well. Mata. Mata means when. Haza. Haza means this. When is this? Al -wadu. Wadu means promise. Wadu is from wa ain and dal, the root words, and wa'ad basically it's a warning, it's a threat that uh, there's going to be resurrection and be prepared for that. And the people who didn't take that warning very seriously, they started asking the date hmm, or the signs of that big day. So they would say to Prophet Muhammad that when actually is going this thing to come through. In, if, kuntum, you are sadiqin. It's in the past, but I, I told you that I'm translating sometimes in present and sometimes I would translate in future for the things which are stated in the past tense in Quran because uh, in the concept of time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all these things basically are done. If kuntum means you are the pure form, sadiqin, if you are truthful, means uh, they are actually showing their doubts on the truthfulness of Prophet Muhammad and they are demanding from him that if you are really true in your words, then you have to tell us the time when this thing will happen, mean the resurrection or the day of uh, uh, the last hour, uh, the end day of this world or universe, so anything can be, you know, taken uh, from this world, wa'adu. The next side, again, very short one, and swad dal qaf is the root word for sadiqin. Kul say innama. Innama is a very special word, and it is used to... You know, uh, uh, say when, when you have to say something categorically, when you have to make a categoric statement and uh, that has no exception at all. You In Arabic, this word is used. Innama. So it is used to make a statement categoric. Innama indeed not but means only this actually is the case. 
there's nothing beside there is no other situation but only this one and what that the ilm the knowledge of what of this wa'ad this promise the knowledge of this promise is in the lahi with allah means allah exclusively knows the exact time when the resurrection will happen when the last hour of this universe will come or when the death of a person will come because prophet muhammad sallam used to mean all these different things at different occasions when he used this word wa'ad so uh, you can take any of these things from the word wa'ad wa innama and again innama the same word is repeated here Anna, Anna, as uh, Amrin was just telling you, Anna means I, and it's short nurse on here. Anna, not Anna. Anna, Nadiru, Mubi, Nadir. You have done it already, which meant warner, the caretaker, the guards of hell were asking the disbelievers, didn't you have a warner? And they said that, yes, we did have one, but we just refuted him. Mubin is from the root letters ba, ya, and nun. Ana, I am just a warner. Mubin means open, clear, explicit, uh, without any doubt. I am a warner. And this is not my duty. This is not my job to tell you the date of the last hour or the date of your death or the date of resurrection and all that. So look at the metaphoric meaning. They ask, when will this promise be fulfilled? The promise of resurrection. Because in the previous ayat, uh, you saw the word toshavun, means the, the human beings gathered together. So you can take it in that sense as well. And that's more relevant as well. So when this promise will be fulfilled, if what you say is true, tell us the date, the exact date and the time. Tell them, Allah says to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that those who are asking this question to you, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, tell them from Allah that Allah alone has the knowledge of that because it is something that is related with al-ghaib, ghaib, the unseen. And only Allah has the knowledge of that and Allah doesn't want, Allah doesn't need, Allah doesn't like to share the knowledge of al-ghaib with anyone. Even with, with, with the closest of angels like Jibreel alayhi salam, Allah won't share anything that he doesn't want that it should be shared with them. My mission is only to warn you plainly. I'm not here to tell you the date. I'm not here you to, uh, you know, provide you the answers of the affairs related with the unseen. I'm just warning you. And those who, you know, ignore the warnings, they obviously have to suffer at some later stage. So looking uh, into the detail, which actually is not too much detail because ayat are very simple and very short. So they are asking in the verse number 25, the audience of Prophet Muhammad basically is asking him that when your promise will be fulfilled, when will that hushir, that assembly of the human being, that resurrection take place? Because they had serious doubts about these things. And they would say at a number of places in Quran that when we die and we are buried and over the years we turn into dust, how come is it possible that we are born again? And with the same you know, body, with the same limbs and with the same frame, and the same human being, how is it possible? But even science has uh, uh, proved that human DNA never dies, and it is the DNA which actually is responsible for the recreation of the human beings. If, if someone really is interested in scientific you know, proof of that thing. Anyways, they have serious doubts about it. And the opposite of doubt is yakin. Those who have yakin, those who don't doubt the promises of Allah and his prophets, they never ask such questions. Or even if they ask such questions, the reason is not to refute. The reason is not to 
you know, uh, doubt the truthfulness of the prophet. The reason is just to increase their state of yakin or their state of belief. And we have seen even the prophets asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that yakin, which is ilm al yakin, the knowledge of, you know, uh, surety, the knowledge which is the degree uh, to the utmost degree of certainty that there is no doubt about it. And in one of the narrations of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu we are told that once a man asked the same question to him, but he didn't ask the question to doubt the truthfulness of Muhammad Sallallahu or to reject his message, but actually he wanted to get reassured. He wanted to know about some signs of the last hour so that when he observes those signs and he can better prepare himself for the time or for the time of his death. So Prophet Muhammad says, instead of giving him the date or the time, he said that what preparation you have made for it means the basic purpose of warning the people that there is going to be a hasher of them or there is a va'ad or a promise that is going to be fulfilled and after that you all have to stand in front of your Lord, your Creator. The purpose of all these things, mentioning these things, is to warn the people, is to make them feel that they have to prepare themselves for that, that trial or test. So Muhammad asked him that what preparation you have made. The question is irrelevant when that last hour is going to be established. And the last hour of any human being can be the hour of his death. Because when someone dies, his year after his next life begins there. And no one is sure of his death. And no one is sure of anyone's death. So Prophet Muhammad he couldn't you know, answer such questions at all. And uh, the, the, these things in the Quran basically are to are not to arouse curiosity because some people get really very curious and they try to enter into the metaphysics of the religion and try to get a rational explanation or scientific explanation of everything which actually is not possible. And these mainly are the people who do not want to believe in what Allah says in the Quran. And next is the verse number 26, which says, Qul inna man ilmu in the lahi, means categorically stating the as a matter of fact, the ilm, the knowledge of this last hour rests with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exclusively. And because this is al surah we are doing, the dominion, this is the part of Allah's dominion. And Allah doesn't share, you know, uh, some things with any of his creature at all. And it shows that the messengers of Allah had no knowledge of the ghaib. Because some people believe that Prophet Muhammad Sallam had the same degree or same level of knowledge and understanding of the things as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. But we are told through the narrations of Prophet Muhammad Sallam and uh, through the verses of Quran that all the entire you know, a human knowledge put together, collective knowledge of human beings is just like the drop of water from an ocean, including the knowledge of prophets as well. No doubt that Muhammad was the most knowledgeable person on the face of this earth. But that doesn't mean that he had a complete grip over the ilm al ghaib as well. So some people hold this belief and not only they associate this thing with prophets of Allah, but there are some common human beings who sometimes claim that they have certain, you know, ways and means of getting access to the al ghaib and they know the these things. And then the, you know, ignorant people, they start following such uh, uh, people who make these claims as well. And it's really a very serious thing. And it should be avoided. If messenger of Allah says that he does not know when is the last hour going to be established, how can a common Muslim or a common human being claim that he knows the you know uh, secrets of Al-Ghaib? There are so many you know 
people like uh, they have different uh, sorts of knowledge. They claim to have different sorts of you know means. Some of them uh, have uh, you know they, they make claims that they have <laughs> jinns or the devils under their control, and they gather information for them. And you know many such other things that even um, believing into them it makes your uh, belief rather you know uh, wrong or make it affects your belief the state of belief. So we should avoid avoid following such claims and such people. No one can claim, as a matter of fact, no one can claim that he does know the future. Because future is something related with al-ghaib. No one knows what is going to happen to them after five minutes. And that was the case with the prophets of Allah as well. Only Allah's knowledge is the complete knowledge. And sometimes when people, you know, claim that they have the knowledge of the future or their guessing power is really very good, okay? To some extent, people can guess things. But most of the time, it turns out to be simple conjecturing and it has no, no solid foundation, no solid, solid ground. But at some times, even guessing is prohibited for us. We can hope for certain things, but at certain points, even, you know, expressing your hope that I expect that this is going to happen like this. For example, a very noble or pious person dies. And most of the people record their witness by saying that Allah will enter him into his paradise. That's a good thing because these witnesses count but no one can be sure and if somebody says you know with complete surety that such and such person is going to enter into paradise and there is no one who can stop him from entering there again is something like interfering in the dominion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah won't allow anyone at all Allah won't allow the prophets Allah won't allow the angels you know to interfere with this dominion so this al ghaib is a speciality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, the knowledge of the sa'a, the last hour, rests with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. If anyone says that he knows about the future and he has some knowledge regarding this fact, is, uh, uh, a, is making a false claim and we shouldn't, uh, number one thing, that we shouldn't be curious about such things and number two, that these things are mentioned as a warning and we should take that warning very seriously and we should prepare ourselves for that final trial of our existence in this world. So the ayat are very short. The explanation also is really short. So it's over from me and I'll hand over the Zoom session to Amarini.